I'm just going to go over a little schedule for this afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. We are here to talk uh, to hear speakers talk to us about anti-racist healthcare practice and health inequities. Our guest speakers today are Dr. Josephine Etowa and Dr. Elizabeth McGibbon. After they present, we're going to have a brief question and answer period. Uh, as the doctors will not be able to remain and join us for the larger group facilitation later. But we will have a five minute break with some breakout rooms and uh, a larger group discussion facilitated by our own Dr. Annette Schultz. We're gonna move now to the land acknowledgement being uh, shared with us by Victoria Eziamu. We'll do a little bit of housekeeping after that and talk about how we can make this a safer space. Victoria, whenever you're able. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and the continued harms of today. We dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you. Just a few housekeeping rules to remember to keep your mic muted unless you are speaking. And please maintain the privacy and confidentiality of others. We all have a part to play in ensuring this is a safe space. Just a reminder, we borrowed this from our Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Office because we feel this is very important when coming together to talk about such sensitive things. We will speak for ourselves and allow others to speak for themselves with no pressure to represent or explain a whole group. We will listen with resilience, hanging in when someone or something is hard to hear. If tempted to make attributions about the beliefs of others, we will instead consider asking a question to check out that assumption we are making. We will assume good intentions without ignoring impact. We will keep in mind that understanding and agreeing are not the same thing. And that all stories stay here, but please share the ideas. We have a series of uh, resources for students and participants in our speaker series today. These resources will be posted again before the conclusion of our event so that you may copy them. Or you can always reach out to the anti-racism email, which I will provide in the chat if anyone has any questions or is interested in participating on our committee. It is my pleasure to introduce one of our two brilliant guest speakers today, Dr. Josephine Atoa. She is a professor for the School of Nursing, Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Ottawa, current holder of the OHTN Chair in Black Women's HIV Prevention and Care. She's the past holder of the Loye de Silva Research Chair in Public Health Nursing, past co-chair Community Health Nurses National Standards, and past president of Health Association of African Canadians. Known for her leadership in anti-racist and health equity work, Dr. Atoa's research has resulted in seminal contributions to the Canadian health policy and bringing racism to the forefront of dialogues. Her co-authored Anti-Racist Healthcare Practice and co-edited Community Health Nursing, a Canadian Perspective books are well cited. Her research program includes studies on health equity, perinatal health, HIV AIDS, Nurses Work Life and Community Health Nursing. Please welcome Dr. Etowa with me. Thank you. Today we also are very delighted to bring her uh, counterpart, Dr. Elizabeth McGiven, who is an applied critical health social scientist. Her focus is on how public policy created oppression gets under the skin to deepen disadvantage and create intergenerational health damage, while at the same time, 
enhancing privilege and wealth for some. Along with Dr. Josephine Atoa, she published the first Canadian books to address anti-racism, specifically in health practice, healthcare practice, and oppression as a social de detriment of health, edited volume. Elizabeth is particularly interested in synergies among the structural determinants of health, the illogical, ecological determinants of health, and the social determinants of health. She lives and works near the sea with her partner, Pat, on the East Coast in Mi'kmaq, the ancest ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Welcome, Elizabeth. I will now pass it over to our presenters to share with you today. Can you see my slides? Okay, great. Uh, so thank you for inviting Elizabeth and I. Uh, we've been colleagues for many, many years, right from graduate school, we started talking about these issues. And at some point we decided that we put our experiences that we've been talking about into a textbook that was in 2009. And we continue to engage in that journey to talk about uh, anti-racist healthcare practice. Uh, so we will take the opportunity to start with uh, health inequities to share so why it's so important for us as nurses, as healthcare uh, professionals to continue to engage in this work. We'll touch on race and racism, focus on structural racism, and uh, share some of our thinking around nursing practice theories and anti-oppression work as some of the key ways that we can address uh, racism in healthcare. So why racism? Racism has been increasingly associated with health inequities. That's what I want to first. Let's start with social determinants of health. So the social determinants, including the structural inequity, inequalities and discrimination are known to account for disproportionate health risk and differential health outcomes experienced by racialized people, including African, Caribbean, and Black people in Canada. And I prefer to use those three concepts in describing black, black people in Canada because it allows us to touch on each of the uh, background of the people. So African referring to those who have migrated from the continent of Africa, Caribbean referring to Black people who have migrated from the, from the Caribbean, and Black referring to those Canadians that have been here for multiple generations since uh, the end of slavery here in Canada, and that way no one is left behind. So it's particularly important to talk about these issues because we all saw what happened when COVID-19 exposed the long-standing inequities that have been hidden. We've talked about it for years, but COVID-19 helped us to now recognize it and name it for what it is. And so in the case of COVID-19, the excess cases and deaths among Black people globally have been attributed to disproportionately high rates of COVID uh, comorbidities. So conditions like diabetes, like high blood pressure, um, like HIV, HIV, the area I focus uh, my research uh, right now, one whole stream of my research is looking at that. In Canada, Black people or ACB people make up uh, about 4% of the Canadian population. But when you look at HIV and new diagnosis, we continue to represent a quarter of those living with HIV, 25%. And that number is not changing, even though we're seeing that the HIV programming and strategies that have been implemented over the years is beginning to show in terms of gay men, men who have sex with men, but African Caribbean and Black people who are also a priority population for HIV work, we're not seeing that number change uh, significantly. Uh, the summit I was at was talking about this. Why, is the numbers, why are the numbers not changing? 
again, structural determinants. So as we touch on that, I just want to give, uh, give you at least one of the stats that really show these inequities. So structural factors related to income is uh, such as employment, food insecurity, were all key parts of why uh, HIV, uh, COVID-19 impacted on this community differently. And I would share uh, one, just one qualitative um, narrative of somebody just talking about how they were affected. Belt environment, which necessitates risky working conditions outside the home and using public transportations were all part of what creates these inequities. So racism has been increasingly associated with inequitable uh, health outcomes for racialized people. And you can see international uh, documents and I, I purposely cited these three so this is the National Collaborating Center for the Determinants of Health, national organization. And then the next point there, Black Canadians of, uh, of African descent continue to experience poor health outcomes related to systemic anti-Black racism. United Nations, remember this is the decade for people of African descent. And some of this, the expert working group came up with that. And then even Public Health Agency of Canada has documented this, that it shows Black Canadians' health outcomes were disproportionately poorer than those of white, their white counterparts, even though they report positive health behaviors. And so inequities exist. What makes race important then, that we have these inequities along racial lines. So pure races in the sense of genetically homogeneous populations do not exist in the human species. Nor is there any evidence that they have ever existed in the past. Biological differences between human beings then reflect both hereditary factors and the influence of natural and social environment. In most cases, these differences are due to the interaction of both. This is the American uh, Association of uh, Anthropology. So racism uh, is the statue quo of our society. And we, in order to address it, we have to think about the processes in which that happened. One of those being racialization. When people, when certain people uh, or people certain characteristic traits and attributes are viewed to be of a lesser world or abnormal. So you speak with an accent, like myself, the manner of speech. And it's interesting because it's not all asset that is looked at as inferior. We've all worked in system where you have different accents from around the world and you know the accent that people have difficulty understanding. And you know the accent that is actually look, uh, sounds attractive to people, they want to hear it. And so at uh, the manner of speech, people's name, clothing, grooming, diet, beliefs, practices, spaces of or, uh, places of origin. Uh, these are all areas where we begin to look at people as inferior. So racism also involves reserving favors. Who you favor? Just think about it in our classrooms as, nurse, as a, uh, nursing professors. When you ask people to create groups, who wants to work with that racialized person over there? Quite often, you're the one that are left out to find your own who you're going to pair up with or you do it alone. So reserving favor, smiles, kindness, the best stories, all of that, one of our most charming side, an invitation to real intimacy for one's own kind or class. These are all ways that racialization happens in our everyday experiences. And so, when we talk about structural racism, because that is the real key here that I think we would touch on, is that while structural racism and systemic racism are both pervasive and deeply embedded in laws and policies and practices and established beliefs and attitudes that actually produce, condone, and perpetuate this widespread unfair treatment of racialized people, they're actually different. Quite often when people talk about structural racism, we think it's only at the systemic level. But actually structural racism permeates all of the level. And I think uh, in a future slide, I will show uh, how they, 
structural racism permeates even the behavior of the individual because it is the power in which that individual behavior is anchored to be able to uh, do what may put others down and just get away with it. And so systemic uh, racism emphasizes the involvement of whole system, uh, political systems, legal system, healthcare system, including the structures that constitute the framework. So structural racism rather is the ideology that tells us this is bad. The ideology that emphasizes things like color blindness, you know, and, and the, like white supremacy. Those ideologies, that's what anchors racism in all levels. And that's the, what, where the problem with the structural racism lies. So structural racism emphasizes the culture, the ideological dimensions, as well as the role of structures such as laws and policies that are the scaffolding of the system. So uh, cultural, uh, I just wanted to give some example of the structural uh, pieces. So again, color blindness, they believe that one should treat all persons equally without regard to their race, even though we understand the impact, uh, the significance of racialization, ordering, utilizing the power within the relationship for subordination and uh, domination. Oh, something happened to my screen. Okay. White supremacy, they believe that people with a white skin are superior and therefore should be dominant over other races not only an attitude, but also a way of thinking. So we cannot just see that as an attitude, but it's the way we think and begin to understand society. And, and I just gave uh, some more examples, but I'm just uh, gonna move on uh, to... Something is blocking my view. All right. Uh, I just give you some example of concepts that you need, we need to think about as we discuss racism. When I see white apathy, it is really sad that this is happening, but it's not my problem. You focus on other things that are more important. I'm too busy to deal with these kinds of discussion about racism. White centering, centering of white people, white values, white norms and white feelings over everything and every, everyone else. Tone policing, that is quite common. Tone policing, uh, when you ask the uh, black indigenous people of color to speak in tones that are considered acceptable to those with white privilege. Um, you, you just think about what maybe happens at work and who you quickly point out that they are actually hypersensitive or too sensitive, uh, or the way they display emotion does not quite fit with the way you would expect a white person to, to display their emotion. So that makes them inferior. Tokenism, get out of racism uh, free card. Um, so you get the single person there that can help you think, say, yes, we actually have diversity here. Our equity, diversity, and inclusion initiative is working because we do have uh, the token person here. And white favor, uh, favorism, they believe that people with white privilege who see themselves as superior in capability and intelligence have an obligation to save the racialized people from their supposedly inferiority and helplessness. And so we think about those in that individual level, but the, the, that way of thinking then affects wherever we find ourselves in the decision-making role. And that's how it gets to the structures that uh, forms the scaffolding of our systems, whether it's the system of education, who gets the scholarship, who has access to the money for uh, their business, who has access to uh, the public health information that is needed to boost their critical literacy level. Uh, the criminal system, what laws govern policing and others. And so you can see uh, how from our internalized level of 
race-based beliefs and feelings within individuals. It leads to the way we communicate with each other, interpersonal, the bigotry, the biases shown between individuals through words and action. And it moves to the institutional level where discriminatory policies and practices within organizations and institutions just continue to uh, implement the whole process. And at the systemic level, we have the ongoing racial inequities maintained by society and the structural racism and cause all of this together. I just wanted to use uh, the iceberg model to illustrate that point again, because when we think about anti-racism, what we're doing, we cannot just focus on the behavioral approaches. We must, we, yes, we have to change behaviors, but while doing that, we must also work at the system level. And, and, do, and, and change our thinking at the systemic level. And so you can see why some of the things we would talk about, whether it's the invalidation, the dismissal, the stereotypes, the microaggressions of everyday insults that quite often we think is not important, but it accumulates to create real mental health impact and physical impact. Those may be seen at the surface level, but when you come down to the institutional or organizational level, you begin to see those things that perpetuate the behaviors you're seeing abo uh, above. Whether it's the normalization of racist behavior, the dismantling of anti-racism initiative, and just plain discriminatory practices and racist policies and practices, that happens at the, at the, at the institutional level. And then as we go deeper into the and roots of this problem into the iceberg here, you see what is the root of the cause? What are the causes of this problem above? What are the attitudes, the beliefs, the morals, the expectations, and the values that keep the system in place? That's where you see the social construction of race and race product, the color blindness, the white supremacy, the white centering and white uh, empathy happening deep down there. And so you can imagine that the people who also govern and uh, create the policies at the system, at the institutional level, are informed by these values. So I'm going to stop there and uh, Dr. McGibbon will take it from here. Just let me know when I need to change your slides, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to uh, build on what uh, Dr. Toa has talked about and um, give a bit more detail around those structural causes uh, and some other things. So uh, what I use this visual uh, to describe what uh, structural or root causes are. And so it's, um, it's obviously a wharf. Um, and underneath, so you can see the surface of the wharf. And you can see the structures underneath. So any of you who are anywhere near uh, water, uh, you know, wild ocean water, will know exactly what I'm talking about or have ever walked on a wharf. So underneath are those uh, anything from solid concrete pillars to 12 by 12 um, wooden uh, supports and so on. So on the surface, in terms of uh, structural or root causes, on the surface of the wharf, uh, we can see um, the everyday results of the, these structural um, oppressions. So for example, um, with uh, Dr. Toa was talking about COVID-19, we can see those stats, they're readily available to see. Um, and we can also see the, you know, some of the day-to-day -day experiences of, of um, racialized and mar marginalized uh, peoples uh, in their dealing with COVID. So there's a certain amount that we can see. Um, and that tends to be where the analysis stops. And it certainly tends to be where the analysis stops in the profession of nursing. Um, so I'm not saying we aren't doing good work and everybody here today is part of that good work actually. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, we tend to stop on that um, you know, on, on the um, surface of the wharf. Underneath the wharf are the structural underpinnings. So I'm just gonna give you one more example on the top of the wharf. 
is um, the racialization of, of um, nursing education. So we can really see on the top of it, we can literally see um, the whiteness of our profession, um, not only in who teaches and who, who is part of, who is, whose voices are included, uh, also in the materials, the documents, the texts that we use. And texts can be anything from an actual textbook uh, to the images on uh, teaching materials, uh, to the choices we make about readings and so on. So texts are visual texts to all of it. So those are very clear to see uh, in terms of racism in nursing. So moving to um, the, the supports, the underneath is those structural supports. So um, the structural supports of um, what's going on, let's say in nursing education, um, are Eurocentrism, colonialism, imperialism, um, white supremacy, white privilege, uh, and so on. So those are those more nebulous concepts that are supporting this, what we can see on the surface. So our, the challenge, of course, is to get underneath that surface, uh, which is really uh, difficult because it requires pulling knowledge from all kinds of disciplines. So you can see, listening to Dr. Atoa, uh, I mean, the both of us are heavily immersed in, in the social sciences um, of health and, and, um, and are able to bring that into our, or, or enjoy bringing that into our work. So um looking at the it from a structural perspective is is uh a really important and of course it's also called root causes so the 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 um, well-known uh analogy to a tree so the roots are causing these things that are happening on the on the the um top of the the wharf uh and we can have next slide so this is something yeah this is something that um went into our first our, our anti-racist healthcare practice book uh, that Josephine and I uh, worked on. So we've been uh, partners um, for a long time. <laughs> I was going to say partners in crime, but that's not that's just a <laughs> that's not a I guess not a good uh, um, a way to describe that at the moment. But so we um, <laughs> we were we've been working on uh, and the, the the seeds of that framework, this anti-racism uh, framework, anti-oppression, anti-racism framework, uh, started a long time ago, uh, and uh, some of it is in our first book, the um, anti-racist healthcare practice. Um, so this is a kind of a, I'm not sure if you can see that. Can people see that, or is there any way to? It looks pretty tiny. The letters. Oh, it does. Can you see it? Can you read it? I can read it. Do you want me read it? No, no, yes. that's okay. Oh, I, I just okay. wanted to make sure that everybody else could. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's it's visually readable. Okay. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah. So this is a um, a draft, uh, which um, this is an adaptation of. Uh, work that um, myself and Joyce Bugwa did for the um, race, culture, and health um, chapter in the edited book that Dr. Toa was talking about. So, so she edited um, community health, a community health uh, nursing book, and um, we were asked to do a chapter on um, race and health. So. This is an adaptation of that. So it's gets getting more, more developed. Um, and, and hopefully, well, eventually will become something that we, we anticipate will be widely used. So, um, so there's three um, areas, overall areas, and, and you know, around anti-racism, anti-oppression, anti-oppression practice. So the first one is seeing so we have to be able to see it we have to train ourselves or teach ourselves mentor ourselves to see what's going on so for example what does the cycle of oppression look like in practice uh education research policy making and leadership so what does racism look like what does genderism look like what does classism look like and so for the the notion the cycle of oppression is something that i've used in all kinds of um publications so how does that cycle work so the the first part of the cycle of course is um 
a stereotyping. So a stereotype is a, is a fixed image, often negative. So we're, we're immersed in stereotypes. We, can't, we cannot um, get away from that. So those stereotypes um, are, are, cause a whole way of thinking. So I'm, I'm going to use a, an example now. Um, I'm going to use, uh, which I have used in publication and so on, is, is um, what happened with, uh, it, it was experienced by Joyce uh, Eshaquan. Um, so it's, it's a hard story to listen to, but it's a, it's a story that um, really speaks to racism and how it unfolds in story, you know, we, we can honor that, uh, the experience of the family and community and so on. So it's, it's by way of honoring um, Joyce Eshaquan and naming what happened there. So the stereotypes, you know, that the, the actually the, the healthcare providers um, were, were using um, are not different than these classic stereotypes of Indigenous peoples. And so the notion of savages, which, as you know, um, is a key stereotype of, 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 um, of Canadians of African descent as well. So there's a whole thread of stereotypes that people have in their heads. And then leading from that is prejudice, which is a whole way of thinking based on these stereotypes. So when, when, when um, Joyce Essequan entered the, um, the hospital in, in Quebec, all of those uh, ways of thinking clicked in. She's, um, she's just here all the time looking for drugs. She's, um, she should be home with her children. What do her children think of when they see her like this and so on? So it just flooded the minds of these clinicians, the, the prejudice. So here's the turning point in the cycle of oppression. It is that you have the stereotype, the um, uh, prejudice, and then becomes discrimination. So discrimination is when one acts on the stereotype. It's an action and just as important as an, is an inaction um, based on those stereotypes. Uh, so in the case of, of uh, Joyce Eshaquan, she they didn't didn't um, she didn't get uh, a standard evidence based care. Uh, she so there was action and inaction. So the inaction was that she she didn't get what she needed. She came with cardiac uh, symptoms. Uh, she she didn't get any uh, cardiac protocols or anything. Um, it's, it's very, it's actually very disturbing. The whole thing is, is, which is why I say honor. Like we're just on every second I'm talking about this, we're, we're honoring what happened so that we can make it not happen again. So, um, and so, so inaction and then action was the terrible things they were saying to her and the terrible racist uh, ways they were talking to her, which as you know, was videotaped, some of which. Uh, so that's discrimination. Another turning point in this cycle of oppression story is, um, the, is, is um, the, the culmination, which is oppression. So what is oppression? It's when systemic structures support all of that. So the hospital, the, um, the uh, um, uh, nursing leadership and so on, the, the hospital leadership and so on, uh, are supporting that. So what are some of those ways? And this is the one that, that's uh, this is the trickiest for, to understand and the trickiest to, to nail down um, is, so how are they doing that? Well, one example would be that uh, the nurses had no, um, there was no training in place whatsoever, no cultural safety training and so on. So the, you're, you have an ahead of time support of all of this by not bothering to, to train nurses, uh, educate them, mentor them, and so on around uh, these kinds of oppressions. Um, the hospital, so I'm, I'm not, now I'm kind of moving away just a little bit from the actual, the, the actual hospital itself, but you know, hospitals in general, um, although there are wonderful light bearing hospitals in the country, there's no doubt about it. Uh, generally speaking, don't, don't see this as a priority. 
And, you know, we've got a, a problem there because if you, you walk into the hospitals, um, and this is part of the systemic piece, you, you look at the board of governors, like look at the pictures of the boards of governors. So I, I've told this story for years and you know what? It's the same story. <laughs> there it's it's almost all white people um and it's almost all it's it's pre, uh, predominantly men usually too so we've got that uh that's the that's the top of the wharf isn't it there it is right there how did that get to be well it's these structures underneath just as an aside um so in in terms of the the fa phases of the cycle of oppression um the the um, oppression itself is supported by all, all of these systems so how did it come to be that this happened to joyce eshaquan so it's a it's a, a very um uh it's an invisible process uh just like the structures under the wharf are invisible uh so that's what what we're trying to do is see those see what's what's going on so that cycle of oppression um getting back to the diagram um is we need to start, see that, start naming that and seeing it, analyzing it, and teaching the students about it. The, and by the way, I find the students are just dying for this. There's a crying for this stuff. They love it. You know, I, I, I've been so, um, you know, so encouraged by the response I get from the undergrad and graduate students around uh, telling the truth about this stuff. So seeing that, and what do privilege and supremacy look like? Uh, white settler privilege, gender-based privilege, social class privilege. So we're, this, this uh, framework he, here is very much based in an intersectionality lens. So that's why we kept the word oppression on there to, to um, underscore that it's, it's racism is about all of these intersecting identities too, isn't it? Um, and the, the notion of privilege and supremacy. So white supremacy is pretty interesting because it's only in the last mm, maybe five years that you could say that in a meeting and they wouldn't think you had your, you, you, you know, had something seriously wrong with you. Uh, so I find that it can be said now out loud. Um, I, I would say it, but the reaction would be, you know, what planet is this white person on? So, um, so we can, um, what do they look like? And so um, we know that um, in terms of the um, racialization of, of education, uh, so what it looks like is that we don't have um, even anywhere near proportionate numbers of, uh, of brown and black skinned people, racialized uh, people uh, teaching um, in clinical or in the, in the um, um, classroom and so on. Uh, and the one further one gets away from um, uh, Toronto and the larger centers, the, the more the more white everything is. So um, that's that's what it looks like is at least in nursing education and the example I gave is already around nursing education fits there. What do oppression, privilege and su uh, supremacy look like? So, uh, in practice, education, research, policy making, and leadership. Like, what does it look like there? Um, and what? So naming that. Uh, and uh, how is racism structural violence? So I'm increasingly using the the notion of structural violence to describe my work, uh, describe what I'm talking about in my work. Sorry, um, because it's um, it is a violence that like, racism kills. So. Uh, I'm, as I said, increasingly, increasingly using the, the notion of violence um, and structural violence. Uh, that's, that's how uh, Joyce Eshaquan died. I'm going to talk about social murder in a second, too. Okay, so, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, so we see it. We train ourselves to see it, um, which is an ongoing process. As none of this is, is um, time... Uh, what do I want to say? None of it is encapsulated. It's all, it's going on all the time. The more you know, the more you want to know and so on. Um, so understanding and mapping. Okay, learning how to see it and then mapping it. So, um, so once we see it, uh, we commit to understanding these root or structural causes because that's the place where change happens. 
Those are the entry points for change, the policy um, and so on. Uh, can be institutional policy. Um, it can be the policies of your, your department. It can be the policies of the provincial and federal uh, government and so on. Um, so, and what is the path or map from, from oppressions in the everyday um, and its societal supports and structures? So the public policies that create these, that create, um, create, sustain, and redeploy. I really like that word redeploy because yes, it's created and sustained, but there it goes. They figured out another way to do it. It's the redeploy part. So it's very, um, it, it, it's going to require a lot of, or it does require a lot of vigilance to um, see, you know, see uh, how this is happening and who is doing it. Uh, who can be an individual? It can be, uh, so I'm focusing on systemic here. It can be policymakers and so on. Um, so what is that path or map? So let, so if we have um, um, uh, the racialized, the whiteness of nursing, um, what is the, which we can see in our faces, um, in our collective faces. So what is the path or map there? Well, it's, it's the Eurocentric white um, colonial foundations of nursing. So, um, and that's where, you know, when we see that, well, we know that we have to work on decolonizing because the whole profession is grounded in that. And it, it really doesn't want to, it's really struggling right now to, to, um, uh, to admit that, to come to grips with that. Um, I did a presentation um, let me see. I'm just going to give you a, I don't want to give any identifying information, but I did an international presentation about, um, not this in particular, but I, I talked about the structural determinants. I talked about um, um, the, the overall frame was decolonizing. So they asked me to speak. And so I was happy to do that. And um, I, I spoke about the, the, what I've just been speaking to you about, uh, the whiteness of nursing and so on. And I was felt, honestly, I felt very privileged because one of the, you'd all recognize the name, emailed me and, and she was very, very polite. But the gist of it was, no, that's not right. And what about this? And what about the other thing? So uh, that was a kind of a mixed, uh, mixed blessing for me. So um, the path or map. So that hearing that path or map, hearing what it is, is is uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable for um, um, for um, white nurses. Um, uh, so it, it's yeah. So I'll I'll leave it at that. It's it's very uncomfortable uh, because it's you know it's all of the things around blaming and so on. Um, one of the things that, which you, I, off the top of my head, you can, um, the, anyway, there are a number of different things that, that I'll talk about them in a moment, actually, uh, resources around that. Uh, so, um, so we can have the third one. Thank you. Okay, so seeing and then mapping it. H how did it come to be? Um, and then confronting it, confronting oppression, racism, and acting for change. So um, once we've committed to understanding and mapping, um, uh, we can continually ask ourselves questions such as, how can I take personal action to confront um, uh, my participation in oppression and my own privilege? Um, Okay, so now I just see I'm going to change that a little bit. See, this is a this is a living document here. So underneath that is going to be how can I take collective action? Um, so we we got to start with ourselves, don't we? So, however, it can't stop there. It has to you know move out to the collective. Um, uh, taking action for decolonization, reconciliation. Uh, so decolonization um, is, is very important uh, and very, a very intricate uh, idea that we could talk about a lot here. Um, 
and that I've written about actually. So if anybody wants those materials or those articles and things, um, I'm happy to share them. Uh, talk a little bit in more detail about nursing and decolonizing nursing and so on. Because there, there's a map there to do. There's, there's a way to do that. Um, act for social change. So before, beyond performance activism. So what's performance activism? I'm sure you've, you've heard that. Um, is uh, taking on an issue, taking up an issue um, on Facebook and so on and so forth. So, you know, putting the, um, uh, for example, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and so on. So uh, putting what you need on Facebook and whatever icons and things, and then that's it. So that goes all on Facebook. Um, and there's no, there's no concurrent uh, move towards really taking, taking it seriously and doing something about it. So, and others have described performance activism a lot, uh, a lot better than I just did. Uh, but we're in a world where performance activism, so it's performative, performing white people performing uh, anti-racism. Uh, so uh, how can I engage in uh, lifelong allyship? So you know that allyship uh, takes on all kinds of different meanings over time. It's, it's very much evolving, the notion of allyship. Um, in terms of working alongside, walking alongside. Uh, and always in that precarious balance between, you know, whiteness taking over, white ideas taking over, uh, white um, ideologies taking over and so on. So we're, there's always a, a, a fine balance there around um, allyship and, and, you know, doing that, doing what, what um, racialized peoples themselves want us to do. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, um, when I was talking about white supremacy, I, I wanted to mention, um, uh, uh, Barner Hess, Hess is uh, eight white identities. So that's um, B-A-R-N-O-R. You can just Google this on Google Images, actually. B-A-R-N-O-R. And his last name is H-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. So he's an American black scholar. Um, and so he has eight white identities. Now, I'm not going to talk about each of those. I, want, I just want to plant the seeds for you. Um, we've talked a bit about white privilege and white supremacy, but his list is the best one I, I've ever seen. Um, so he, he go, it goes from white supremacist, and he has some definitions there. So white supremacist, white uh, voyeurism, white privilege. And as a sidebar, uh, Robin DiAngelo's work, which I'm sure you, many of you are familiar with, is, is really a good place to start as well as continue around um, white, uh, white privilege. So he's really got it nailed. This is a, a white uh, sociology professor, uh, American woman. Uh, white benefit, white confessional, um, uh, white critical. This is when white people start to become critical and start to understand things. Um, uh, uh, white traitor. So that's when you, you start to speak up as a white person and you're, you are in all kinds of ways are seen as a traitor and treated accordingly. But I've been at uh, national conventions and um, we'll be doing some kind of a presentation. And then we, with my language I'm using today here and, and people came up to me afterwards and said, oh, that was great. You're the first person who talked about these things. And we really want to hear more during this conference and so on. So it was all lovely. I go to lunch and it's the great big banquet tables. You know, they see eight people seating at the uh, seated at banquet tables. And I find a banquet table and nobody would sit with me. I sat at this banquet table all by, me, all, excuse me, all by myself, uh, which I mean, <laughs> And I'd been into it long enough because I thought, okay. And you know what? I thought, that's good. I scared them. <laughs> scared them into something. Anyway, I, 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 um, I revert into my working class heritage, my working class ancestry at times like that. So lots of four-letter words. And I was really uh, 
you know, I mean, I reflected on it, of course. And who wants to eat alone for heaven's sake? But this whole notion of white trader, like, oh, you know, I don't know what she's about, but I'm not sitting with her. Um, and so the last one is um, white abolitionist. Changing institutions, and I'm reading his definition, Werner Hess's defini definition. Um, changing institutions, dismantling whiteness, and not allowing whiteness to recreate itself. So that's what I, I mentioned with the, uh, I was alluding to that when I was talking about allyship. Um, and um, Cornell West, Dr. Cornell West, I'll finish with this, is a, uh, um, he's a very, uh, very famous uh, black lawyer in the US. So he has been doing um, anti racism work, um, emancipation work uh, for decades. So I had the privilege of seeing him. Um, it, this was, um, has to be a couple of decades ago. But anyway, I had the privilege of seeing him and he gave this beautiful presentation. Uh, what a speaker, you know, you can go on YouTube and find some of his work. He, he's just, he's the most inspiring person and he doesn't, he's, he's, uh, he's so direct and so intelligent. Um, so he finishes his, his speech, which was wonderful uh, about racism. And um, what he said was, you know, the one thing that happens, he says, we have to understand, and the audience was mostly black people, black scholars, actually. Uh, he said, when, when we, we finally get ahead a little bit, you know, we get maybe get more employment equity, maybe get more black professors hired and so on. He said, as soon as we do that, the white people figure out how to pull it back you know, they start working on pulling it back. Now, that doesn't mean that a bunch of white people got in a room somewhere and said, oh, there's going to be too many black academics. Maybe that happened. I don't know. But that's not what uh, he was talking about. He was talking about the insidious nature of as soon as white people feel that we're getting ahead, you know, here we are, we're moving. Oh, well, they're moving. They're getting ahead. You know, we have to um, implicitly find ways to and it happens implicitly it happens in a very hidden way so I, that to me is one thing that really stands out for me still in in my uh anti-oppression and anti-racism work as a white person is is um he's right he's absolutely right so that's uh that's part of the challenge okay i'm going to uh stop there thank you very much everyone Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Dr. McGibbon. Thank you, Dr. Atoa. Thank you. Because we know that uh, we only get to share you for a few more minutes. We're gonna go right to any questions that anyone might have, after which we'll take a five minute stretch break, uh, coffee break, and come right back for our breakout rooms. I think we have enough time to spend, uh, we'll see how the questions go, but we might have a few extra minutes to spend in those breakout rooms. But I can't thank you enough for all the, um, the wonderful information that you shared with us today. It's really inspiring to know that uh, as a community here at the College of Nursing, we are on the right path. We have come together with a committee and uh, the, the committee that brought you here today. So thank you so much. I'll go straight to questions now. Thank you. So Katie, do you have a question? I, I do. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. McGiven and Dr. Etoa, for uh, a very provoking and um, a thought-provoking um, presentation. I wanted to just lean in a little bit on the discomfort piece. And I think um, there were two points that were made, and that is the structures are invisible and that truth telling is essential. Those are the two um, sentences that have hit me. It brings me back to 20, I think it was 2020, it was Florence Nightingale's birthday, right? Her 200th birthday. And uh, we were talking as a committee, this committee is just brand new, right at that point. And we were talking about uh, nursing week 
and celebrating um, celebrating Florence Nightingale, our professional, basically our professional icon, right? Um, and I was uh, informed by one of our former committee members at that time that Florence Nightingale actually started this colon colonization, um, white supremacy um, um, background to nursing. And, you know, and that we really needed to look at what our history is in nursing and think about how that history has affected um, who we are as a profession. And, and she brought to my attention as well that in, in New Zealand, the Maori Nurses Association have chosen not to celebrate Florence Nightingale's birthday for that reason. I want to ask you uh, your thoughts on this. Um, you know, this is, for me, my initial reaction was, wow, I did not know that. And yes, that is true. I, as I think more about the history, I mean, I actually did my research in undergraduate. I did a paper on Florence Nightingale without any thought about what um, her history was and colonization and how the impact of her, of, of her, story has been on the movement for uh, black nurses and nurses of color um, and how that had, has been influenced. I wanna ask you your opinion on that and how do we move forward with this? Um, very big question. <laughs> but before we get to answering that question, I think I'd like to add a little story, my own story uh, my PhD work examined the work life of black nurses in Nova Scotia. And during that uh, research, I discovered that Nightingale actually, actually worked side by side with Mary Sickle, the black nurse in the Crimean War. That Mary Sickle, the Jamaican woman who used herbs and others to treat people and had the same vision uh, that Nightingale had was refused funding, was refused to go to the Crimean War, but Nightingale was supported and funded to be there. And so she went and set her tent and did whatever she could do. And for many years, we celebrate Nightingale. We don't celebrate the other people that actually made personal sacrifices with no resources, no funding to do it. I think in the UK, they've recognized that work. Uh, they have Mary Sickle statue and, and, and awards to celebrate those kinds of heritage. So I just want to add to that what is the act of omission as well. So action or inaction is discrimination. The act of omission is one. So that is part of that story. But in terms of answering your question of, what we do in terms of celebrating her birthday, she made a contribution to our profession. We cannot take away that. That is true. There's a distinct contribution she made. But along with that, truth telling, uh, being able to share our history, even in, in ugliness, and put it all out there so that the nurses of tomorrow understand where we've come from and why this kind of work of deconstructing and walking through is so important. Uh, we would have to think, and I would leave that to, for us to have that discussion, where you think we go with going back to punish or where does it take us? What does it add to the profession? If you celebrate somebody who did something good, or I, I would like to see more inclusive celebration of the many contributions of others, like Mary Siko. So I'll stop there and let Dr. McGibbon and others uh, add to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's interesting that Mary Siko, because when I took over teaching a course, um, basically introduction to professionalism, professional mm -hmm. nursing and so on. And I got, the, as we often do, we get the slides from the person, people who taught it before and we share those mm -hmm. around and so on. And the, the slides were all about um, Florence Nightingale. So I, I'm not mm -hmm. dissing my colleague. This is classic all over the place, isn't it? Every nursing school. <laughs> so, 
So <laughs> I got very busy and put these beautiful pictures of, you know, um, Mary Seacole and so on. And, and how I learned about this in the first place is from my colleague, uh, Dr. Mavis Malaudzi, who was the first black uh, dean of nursing in South Africa. Um, so we collaborated on, on a few projects and she taught me all about this world. Um, mm. So, yeah, I absolutely, I agree with everything you've um, so clearly said, um, Dr. Toa. And our nursing curriculum, um, I mean, there's some concrete paths forward here because our nursing curriculum across the country and, and then certainly in the US, where people have studied this, so we're moving, moving to more and more to a medical surgical um, focus in our curriculum. Um, and the biggest evidence we have of that is the NCLEX exam, which doesn't even know what the social determinants are. So uh, we, we, we did that, we willingly did that as, as a profession. So, you know, what we need are more leaders who will just say no. Like say, no, we're not doing that. We have a, a great, uh, it was pretty sophisticated too. When you think of that, the, the um, CNA exams. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. 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 So that's, that's, and how do we make leaders who, who just say, no, well, we've got to get, we've got to politicize uh, undergrads, graduate students, and so on. And, and what are we waiting for? They love it. They just get so energized, but we will not uh, integrate this. Uh, we as a collective are, are just uh, do not integrate this in any kind of substantive way and pockets of excellence notwithstanding because I know there are a whole bunch of them in, in um, yes. led by um, you know black and indigenous nurses across the country uh, but we we really are stuck in the um, that old-fashioned notion of we help individuals and that's what we do. And don't get me wrong, we sure do have to do that, don't we? we have to do it with compassion and knowledge and safety and all of that. But we like to stay there. We like our curriculums to stay there. Um, and you only have to try to change it a bit to understand the, the, how uh, intransigent it is. Just try to get a, a new course called Political Activism in Nursing through your school. Well, the first thing will be, well, we don't have any room. <laughs> and all this other stuff, right? So, so you know, I, I've been, they have to learn about, you know, 15 different kinds of rare cancer, but we can't put this other stuff in. So yeah. we're just joking ourselves, you know, we're kidding ourselves, really. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll just finish with um, that I, I, there are so many illuminating, light bearing people it, it, pushing this in anyway. I don't think there's probably not a university um, in Canada, uh, nursing uh, university program that doesn't have some light bearers trying to push it in, push it in. What we need to do is to take the burden off them and everybody, let's push it in. Let's not, it's all the same. It's all the usual suspects, isn't it? The ones who are trying to get this stuff in somewhere. So thank you. Are there any other questions for our presenters? Shona, it's Shireen Bell. I have a question. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for this amazing presentation. Hello, Annette. It was uh, so great to see your face too. Uh, Dr. McGibbon and Dr. Atoa, thank you so much. I'm a very recent PhD candidate now. <laughs> University of Manitoba, and uh, my topic is on uh, exploring expressions of resilience in BIPOC undergraduate mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. Just wondering, and I'm looking at appreciative inquiry, and I'm also looking at uh, using the concept uh, and critical framework of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Wondering from your perspective, um, how does intersectionality fit with your work? Good question. Uh, you know, uh, recently, Elizabeth, when I looked at the book, I thought, we were talking about this in 2009. Like, yeah, that didn't yeah. Really yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so definitely intersectionality does fit. There's no way you would talk about racism and all of this ism um, without looking at how they intersect to magnify the problem, or sometimes to solve the problem, they intersect. 
And so we cannot look at uh, gender, race alone. And even when Elizabeth and I first worked on that book, we actually fought against the title anti-racist because we said, we've, we, I think at that time we said, it's eliminated the other pieces that we wanted to talk about all of those together. And, and we worked with our publisher and, and agreed. But at first it was like, we want to be able to show that in this race piece, you cannot just separate it and not put in the intersection. So uh, that, I don't even think you have much choice now. Uh, most funding organizations, CIHR, Public Health Agency of Canada, want you to do intersectional research. <laughs> they require you. We're now feeling even uh, those modules around implicit bias and indigenous cell, you have to show how they intersect even in your research, which is progress. And, and so I, I encourage you to bring an intersectional lens and keep the critical piece mm -hmm. in there so that you do not lose. It, it includes critical race theory, critical race, uh, social theory. And so make sure that the critical piece remains as part of what you're doing in intersectional work. Um, in most of my work, I use the social ecological model to make sure I capture the layers, the levels, but in addition, I always bring in the intersectional piece to see how these layers also has the critical intersections of the social determinants layering up there at the individual level. What does education, what role does education play when these things are happening at the individual level, at the organizational level, and at the systemic level? So you have to walk through the system and the social ecological model, the micro, the meso, the macro, mm -hmm. and but also look at the intersections of the thing, the social determinants between that. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. That was amazing. I have a lot of homework to do. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just add a, a few quick things. Um, the, about the title of the book, it's a, it's a good story, isn't it? So we we once we decided on the racism fo focus on mm -hmm. racism, um, and we had intersectionality in the book itself. Mm -hmm. However, we didn't want to put the word racist in it because yes. we thought, oh, that's going to scare people. We had a big long <laughs> focus. On, you know, no, what, what are we going to call it? What are we going to say? Because we want people to buy this thing. You know, there's a it's a fine balance between being a renegade and also trying to, you know, you want to draw people in. So that's a fine balance between scaring the hell out of people and um, drawing them into the fold. Yeah. So we know we weren't going to use racist. And then the publisher, the woman we were working with, um, said, what, what, why aren't you using the word racist? And I thought, OK, there's permission to use it. <laughs> um, and I really liked, um, Dr. Toll, what you said about um, uh, the critical, you know, the critical theoretical perspective and so on. And that's so true. And it's so broad, isn't it? The critical race theory, as you say, uh, uh, queer theory, yeah. mad studies. Um, and, and all kinds of other, uh, the critical feminism. So there's all kinds of critical feminisms. Um, so it's a, you know, once you go do down that road with the intersectionality, then it's, it's, uh, it's pretty darn interesting and it's, it's very complex and, and absolutely rewarding to, you know, the lights will go on. Oh, I get why that's the case. You know, I get why life is so hard for, for a person in this situation is because they're all overlapping all of these oppressions, aren't they? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I see Cynthia has her hand up. I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, can you? Okay, thank you for really very, very interesting presentations, really, really clear. And I don't know whether we can get hold of these slides afterwards, but you know, really, really interesting. But I do have a, a question because I think a lot of this uh, theoretical information um, that you've put together so well is a lot of it, I think, comes from the United States. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I see racism as much more of a, uh, a human issue 
-hmm. a broader human issue. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, I think of things like Myanmar, what happened in Yugoslavia, what has happened in, in a number of African countries. I mean, you know, unfortunately, whites have, have certainly been pretty bad on this, but we're in, and whites within whites, you know, Nazi Germany. Uh, so I'm just wondering, do we need to broaden framework somewhere? And I don't know how or what, mm -hmm. but, but, but do we need to look at this uh, uh, at, at uh, maybe a more broad, uh, broader level? Just a question. So yes. anyway. Yeah. Great, great question. Thank you, Cynthia. Nice to see you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, uh, Dr. Magivin can take it from there. Uh, yes, you're right. Racism is so global. Uh, some of the uh, research we, we've used are actually global. But you notice at the beginning, I wanted to use only Canadian actual literature to make the case for inequity. And uh, because quite often when we're talking about what racism look like, I've gone to uh, audience to speak and they say, oh, that, that must be from the US that, and it's Canadian because these things are happening in Canada. And you know what? It looks like one of my slides got actually pushed back. The, the narrative, the, the qualitative piece I wanted to share in from Ottawa, from um, somebody in Ottawa. So I'm just going to read it. Then I would answer your question. Can you see the story of Adam, Adam's story? Oh, Jesus, that story doesn't want to show. No, we did see it. We did no, see you it. Did. There okay. it is. Yeah. So this is Adam, somebody in Ottawa. And I got this from uh, the local Ottawa Immigration Partnership from their research, their work they've done. And this, uh, this is a slide from I heard them present this and I thought, wow, let me share this. He says, I leave my home and he's talking about the experience with COVID-19 and why more people in his community are affected. And he said, I leave my home and family every day to work, but we barely have enough to survive. I work in a frontline minimum wage job and rely on crowded public transit to get me there. They say we are essential, but really we are the only ones desperate enough to leave our homes every day, in spite of the risk to ourselves and our families. We are so unprepared. I look around on the bus and only see black and brown faces. It is like our lives don't matter. With the rest of the city staying in their homes, setting up their home offices, I am working night and day, just trying to feed my children in a global pandemic, afraid that I would get this virus and bring it back to my family. I have already seen my friends and neighbors become sick, then hospitalized, and some even died. It is as if we will either die from starvation or from this virus. This reminds me of the war we fled when we came to Canada as refugees. I am reliving those memories as I try to survive this crisis. So I think this speaks to some of the real life experiences in Canada and the inequities that exist in Canada. But I, I bring that up for us to see that some of the issues even that man is talking about transcends even racial boundaries because they're poor black white people as well that are dealing with this. So uh, Cynthia, yes, the theories we are proposing can talk about class, gender, race. So where you see race being the determinant of health, it could be class. There are many poor white people that are dealing with these issues we're talking about. And that is why the intersectionality we're talking about is so important. So yes, you're right. Can we look at these theories in ways that transcend one area or one force of marginalization? And yes, uh, when we look at anti-oppression framework, anti-oppression framework deals with oppression in all its ways. 
whether it's through gender, uh, race, class, age, you know, older people face certain kinds of discrimination. Um, even in youth, teenagers, and you see them walk into a store, somebody's already holding their bag, just like they hold when they see the tall black man walking. Uh, so yes, we, we do need to look at how this applies. When I do work, I do the work looking at inequities and where they exist. So my whole program of research is about inequities, where those inequities exist. And race is one of those areas and all the other pieces are also the area. And like you rightly say, what people are dealing with in Ukraine, we don't want to go there. But uh, it's a, a very sad time in the world. Yeah. They, uh, thank you. Thank you. And believe me, I wasn't saying I didn't think there was racism in Canada. No. <laughs> it was the theoretical framework. Okay. I was, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, thank you, um, Josephine. That was great as usual. Um, yeah, you, Cynthia, you raised some really important points there. Um, and so the, the notion of, of the U, uh, U.S. grounding and a, a lot of the um, critical race scholarship in the world is from the US. So we naturally are familiar with those, those folks and, and use them. Um, and paralleling that is the US is where the most comprehensive um, uh, health data and acknowledgement of racism in the system and so on originated. So for example, they were the, for, um, uh, Barton Smith was the first person in the world to do what was called a civil rights health report card. So that was uh, on the on the heels of the Jim Crow laws in the U.S. and black people not being able to get um, any kind of service and so on. And so it's interesting that you know you say the U.S. and that's absolutely correct because mm -hmm. I mean there there are lots of critical race scholars, especially now um, Indigenous cr critical race scholars in Canada uh -huh. uh, and the U.S. and in Australia and in New Zealand, New Zealand. and so on. So there's a, there's a historical uh, thread to, to that tether in the U.S. Uh, and, and Dr. Toe is, is, you know, one of the people who started this, um, trying to, 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 um, explore and explain how racism operates in, in Canada, starting with the, the um, uh, master study, which was the first study in Canada about this issue. So um, that's one of the reasons. And one of the caveats that we use in our writing is separately, and, and the work we do together, is that most data is from the US and the UK. Mm -hmm. And so we you use a lot of that data. And then we say that something like, there's no reason to believe that the same thing isn't happening in Canada. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's wonderful because we have more and more data. And, and Annette, uh, Dr. Schultz is, is part of this uh, data generation, really cutting edge data generation about um, racism and health and racism and cardiac health in particular with First Nations people. So we, we with every five year pass, we've got more in Canada. Um, the other thing you know, I wanted to say was, you know, we, we tend to be, well, I can speak for myself, um, I tend to be um, at that theoretical level because that is where we figure out what our governments up to what are people up to and how can we disrupt it so you 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 know you you tend to one tends to or i tend to um dwell at that theoretical level and what i include when i do my work and this might be what um what you may be talking about is you know how does that get tethered to the pointy edges so i use pointy edges um, and then a previous version of that diagram, I had the pointy edges. So what are the pointy edges? It's what does this look like in people's lives? Like the beautiful, um, uh, profound uh, story that, that um, Dr. Etoa just read. So those are the pointy edges. So when we write, we, our work is full of the pointy edges piece. And I don't know if that's what you mean by the human piece and so on, but uh, it, it is very theoretical but not so much so that first year students can't understand it. <laughs> Actually, I'm just amazed when I teach and I use the table we have in our book that shows 
how we can move from having the biomedical model of systems and, and move to the social uh, sociological model. And when I walk students to the critical piece, when you say, and I walk them through a research project, what you would look at if you were doing this, guided by a, bi a biomedical model, if you were doing it guided by a sociological model, and if you're doing it guided by a critical theory. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it, when you don't bring in that theory, sometimes they can't see how what we're doing is guided by that deeper level thinking, as I showed in the uh, iceberg model. We have to disrupt the ideology deep down, rooted below what we're seeing on the surface of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And it's that theory that helps us to conceptualize what's going on above and hopefully to use it to create the change we need to see above. Thank you, um, Cynthia. That was um, a really interesting question. Now I'll be thinking about that, you can be sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Annette, I see your hand is raised. We're late going into our break, but I'm gonna let you speak. Just really briefly, this has been an amazing conversation and I am so grateful for the thought provoking as Katie said. And with some of the questions that have come to you and that I just focus so much on theory, this little tag goes through my head. This is something I talk a lot about in, in the graduate courses I teach. And that is theory doesn't make life. What theory does is it tells the person you're talking with what we're gonna focus on here. So if you leave it with the biomedical, you know you're going to be talking about the physical aspects of the person and what's going on there. So by bringing these others, it, it's like then, then you open the space with which we can map and things like intersectionality. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's going on regardless if we include it as a theory or not. Yeah. If we do include it as a theory the space we get to talk about is so much bigger. Mm -hmm. So theory just really helps us in communicating what the map and what the key concepts are going to be that we're gonna talk about within whatever we're doing. So um, I love how much theory got talked about today. That was so great. And I, I just wanted to share that. And thank you again. Thank you, Annette, for bringing us uh, all the effort you put to get us uh, together. I, I want to appreciate you. <laughs> Well, yes. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. And the, and the conversation has been wonderful, too. And, you know, the, trying to ultimately focus on how do you change this, you know, and all of those, as I, I use the word light bearer a lot. And, and one of the things that um, I meant to mention when I was talked about reconciliation in the in the diagram is that um, uh, Kazan has has is a real light bearer here and we were so thrilled that because it's mandated now so that's the structural piece yes. you know, to halt the oppression at that structural level they have the power to do that mm -hmm. and they're taking that on and um they're doing it um they know that they know that it needs to be right and they clearly are just going to do it yes. <laughs> so. Thrilling. Thank you. It's a great uh, <laughs> example, actually, of, of just do it, just do it. Like leaders, leaders who just say no. There you go. There's some. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, everyone. It's been delightful. And thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so me. much. Thank you so much. We're going to take five minutes now. Uh, everybody can come back at 1.36 and we'll go into some breakout rooms. Before we go into the breakout rooms, I'll give you an explanation when we come back, but go stretch your legs and see you at 1.36. And thank you so much to our wonderful presenters here today. I'm really inspired to keep up the good work we've all started here at the college and uh, can't, wait, uh, can't wait to check out all the great references you provided today and the <laughs> authors and the lawyer and uh, we've got, we've got more uh, work cut out for us. So thank you again for coming and see the rest of you in five minutes. Thank you. Bye. Bye.